Tonight's program is co-sponsored by our friends at the Monmouth County Library. Good evening. Tonight, we welcome Professor Graham Russell Gow Hodges, Professor of History, Africana, and Asian Studies at Colgate University, and author of several books, some of which we'll learn about shortly. Graham's research on slavery in the Northeast was integral to MCHA's current exhibit, Beneath the Floorboards, Whispers of the Enslaved at Malpit Hall, so we certainly owe him a debt of gratitude. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Hodges. Thank you very much, Dana, and good evening to everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be uh, back in Monmouth County, even if virtually. Uh, Monmouth County has a very special place in my heart and in my intellectual development because it's really there uh, that I first discovered uh, the pathway uh, to learning about Black history of New Jersey. Uh, and the first slide that we see here is a fascinating letter written by David Foreman, who was a prominent patriot uh, during the American Revolution from Monmouth, uh, to Governor William Livingston, uh, the first patriot governor of the state. Uh, and in this letter, which is written in August of 1780, uh, Foreman is writing to Livingston in an anguished way, talking about uh, the depredations of a Colonel Ty and his motley crew who are raising the state, uh, who are coming in seizing people, uh, seizing animals, uh, produce, uh, burning houses, re literally wreaking havoc on the patriots. And so Foreman is asking Livingston uh, to declare martial law uh, in Monmouth County uh, with a, poss a possibility of increasing uh, military presence there. Uh, so this letter, which I first encountered at, when I was working for uh, the William Livingston Papers at NYU, uh, is really a great way to get into the Black history of Monmouth County and of Black New Jersey in general. Uh, because of this letter, uh, my responsibility uh, for the Papers of William Livingston was to annotate every possible aspect of this letter. And that's why the way we, uh, we edited th these kind of documents. So I learned about this Colonel Ty. Uh, he had been written about earlier by uh, a wonderful historian, uh, Benjamin Quarles, in his book, uh, The Negro and the American Revolution, published back in 1961. But not much else had been done about him. So I researched as part of my job more about Colonel Ty, learned that he was originally Titus Corley's we go to the next slide, please. Uh, in Titus Corley's ran away uh, from his master, John Corliss, uh, who was a Quaker, although not a very good one. Uh, Corliss had already been uh, sanctioned by the Philadelphia meeting, which he was a member of, Shrewsbury being part of that meeting, uh, for drinking, uh, for gambling and cursing. Uh, but now um, even more serious concern. In 1755, the meeting passed a minute, which was kind of a, a declaration, uh, that they wanted friends, Quakers, uh, to relinquish their slaves. And gradually over the next 10 or 15 years, most Philadelphia meeting friends did just that. They uh, freed their slaves, uh, they gave them a term of work, uh, they didn't sell them, they were not supposed to profit from this, but gradually almost all of the Philadelphia meeting friends had done this, with the exception of Corliss and his uh, mother, Zilpha. Uh, she had been uh, in Mama since almost the entire 18th century. So uh, the Quakers went to visit uh, John Corliss to discuss the problem with him. And when the Quakers did that, uh, they didn't just drop by and hand out a pamphlet and, and wish him well. They would stay and talk for hours and hours, and then they would return again. There was ample discussion with Corliss, even though he refused uh, to, uh, to free his enslaved people, free, refused to educate them. Uh, basically, he could not see the way to doing that. So what's fascinating about this is that Titus, who later becomes Colonel Ty, hears Corliss talking to these friends. Uh, and just at the time of Lord Dunmore's proclamation uh, in Virginia, which declared that all Negroes and indented servants pertaining to the rebels 
who are willing to help His Majesty suppress the current horrid rebellion will be free. So this is a great allurement. And Titus goes down to Virginia, joins up with the Black Regiment, later on comes back up to uh, the New York, New Jersey area in 1775, 1776, uh, and becomes part of the Black Brigade. And then also has this own group of motley uh, uh, rebels uh, who uh, raid uh, his master, Barnes Smock, and other Monmouth County people. So this is, he's become kind of a hero. And uh, since I wrote about him uh, in that, uh, uh, in the William Livingston papers, and then subsequently in, in advertisements and in other books, uh, he's become a very popular figure. And the next slide we see uh, is a popularization. This was done for a, a TV show uh, on uh, Blacks in the American Revolution. Uh, it's not very accurate, but it's kind of a fun thing uh, to see. So having said all of that, once I began working on Colonel Ty, uh, I already had finished my dissertation on New York City Cartman and was putting it out to pu for publication, but I was looking for a second project. I felt that there was uh, kind of an amnesia about black life and uh, slavery uh, in early New Jersey and New York. Uh, indeed, when I first started working on this and talking about it, people uh, said that uh, they didn't know that there was slavery or African-Americans in early New York and New Jersey. But in fact, uh, blacks were very integral to the settlement of both colonies and, and later of states. So uh, what I found myself doing is getting into this as a as project. And I'd already finished my dissertation on New York City Cartman and was putting it out in publication, but I decided I would find out more because it seemed to me that historians had not really well covered this topic. So I first went to uh, the early parts of New Jersey and later on up to the Civil War. But if we go to the next slide, please. I began to work on it and eventually produced this book, which is Slavery and Freedom in the Rural North. Before I did that, I published with the Monmouth County Park System two very large pamphlets detailing the progress towards freedom. Uh, and it was a very halting progress. Uh, it one that took a long, long time. Uh, I wanna give a shout out to Gail Hunton if she's in the audience tonight because uh, she hired me to do this along with Jane Alexander. And we had a wonderful relationship with eventually wound up with this book, which is now 25 years old. Um, but the next slide, please. And eventually I published this book in 2018, uh, which is an overall history of Black New Jersey. Uh, from the 1670s up to the present day. And this is, I think, a, a really a fun book if you wanna learn about all of uh, Black New Jersey. And then third, the next slide, please. I also learned about this fascinating person. Marion Thompson Wright, a Newark native, was the first Black woman to earn a PhD and the discipline of history. She finished her dissertation at Columbia University in 1940, and her book was published in 1941, The Education of Negroes in New Jersey. It's still a very worthwhile and informative book. It has not been that dated, uh, and I'll be referring to it several times within this talk. But just a couple of months ago, I published this reader, which includes her book, The Education of Negroes in New Jersey, as well as a number of her prize-winning essays, her ample number of book reviews, and a wonderful encyclopedia entry that she did of Lucy Diggs Slow, the first Dean of Students at Howard University and Marion Thompson Wright's mentor. Additionally, I compiled a 75-page biographical introduction, which is, talks about her fascinating life, and I certainly encourage you uh, to, to get into this. So all of these things have demonstrated just how uh, my fascination with Colonel Ty has resulted in a number of publications uh, on the topic. Next slide, please. Now, let's go back to the origins. This is Lewis Morris. And Lewis Morris was uh, a prominent owner of a large mine and farm at Tinton Falls in Monmouth. He was an important political figure, very closely tied to the crown. Uh, and owned about 
67 enslaved people at his death at 1691. 21 men, 11 women, six boys, three girls, and fascinatingly, 25 children under the age of 10 years. So he was trying to create what often we call a plantation, but these days we talk about as a slave work camp. Uh, Morris was very closely tied uh, to the assembly uh, in New Jersey and in New York. Uh, he was uh, associated with the crown. One of the interesting uh, arguments has been made very recently by Holly Brewer in a fascinating article published just a couple of weeks ago, uh, is that while we usually think about slavery as being very much an American phenomenon, and that the crown sort of let it happen, the British crown, in the colonies, but it didn't really occur very much in England, Brewer has argued that men like Morris were so closely tied with the Board of Trade, with the Church of England, with the governors, that in fact, slavery developed in the New World very much at the legal permission of England. It was not something that happened apart from English rule, but something that happened very, very much within uh, their understanding. So Morris is very important. And next slide, please. Um, but that's one man, and he dies in 1691. Um, he had a, a large farm, but most of the early settlers, Dutch, Huguenot, English, Scot-Irish, uh, and others, were white settlers, and their colonial settlement of East Jersey and Monmouth County was accompanied by slavery. Slavery was hegemonic. It was virtually everyone owned enslaved people in, in Monmouth County uh, in, a, in the beginning of the 18th century. It was codified into law in 1704 and then uh, also amplified in 1714, which meant that from 1704 until a century later, when New Jersey passed a Gradual Emancipation Act, we have a century of full legal slavery, that that was the law of the land. And punishments were very harsh. A lot of the New Jersey code was borrowed uh, from South Carolina. Um, many of the same people came up from uh, Barbados and Jamaica to settle in uh, uh, South Carolina and in Jersey. So uh, there's a close association with, with Southern uh, 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 sl slavery. Little by little, Monmouth County's population developed. There were 4,500 whites in 1726, almost 4,500 enslaved people, about 13% of the population. By 1738, there are almost 5,500 whites and over 650 enslaved black people. By uh, 1771, the Monmouth population is 9,800 white people and almost 1,400 enslaved people. This means that Monmouth County was certainly a slave society, a society in which slavery was integral to the means of production and to the society itself. And this correlates with ethnicity because Dutch and Huguenot were for the principal slave owners, but it was really almost everybody. Much of this growth, of course, comes from the foreign slave trade and enslaved people were directly imported into Perth Amboy, uh, into Camden, into New York Harbor, and then sold uh, to uh, masters and mistresses in New Jersey. Uh, blacks were the largest immigrant group in 18th century America. And the desire for labor to work on the wheat farms, the dairy farms, uh, the mills of Monmouth County was necessary because there were not many indentured servants. In fact, it was claimed of New Jersey that whites manure no land but their own. What we have in Monmouth County and in New Jersey at large is something I explored very deeply in that book, Slavery and Freedom in the Rural North, and that is a small farm and town slavery. This is, means that unlike the South, where slavery existed in very large plantations, Thomas Jefferson's or George Washington's plantations had hundreds of enslaved people. Usually the holdings 
in New Jersey were five, six people, perhaps as few as one or two. They, uh, many single men or single women, but they lived on farms which were not very far away from each other and were oftentimes owned by related people. Uh, Ned Landsman in his early book, uh, Scotland's First Colony, talks about uh, East Jersey as being a settlement of tunes or towns, which were these really these farm villages. And it's on those that enslaved people were uh, trapped with their white masters and mistresses. Slavery was integral to the economy. I mentioned mistresses a moment ago. One of the fascinating things about Northern slavery, and particularly about New Jersey, is that uh, fathers and mothers oftentimes bequeathed enslaved people to their daughters because slaves as movable property would make the daughter more attractive as a marital partner. She obviously would have a fair amount of money. Okay? So it's really important also to the transition of white wealth into the next generations. Okay? Uh, and this is backed up by very tough laws, first initiated in 1704 and 1714, and then subsequently, uh, periodically, there would be an addition to it, something to deal perhaps with uh, selling uh, stolen goods or uh, serving alcohol, uh, holding of guns, anxiety over slave uprisings. There was a big rumor that, uh, 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 rising in 1734. Um, all of these things, by the way, Marion Thompson writes uh, covers in a prize-winning essay that she published in the Journal of Negro History in uh, 1943, and is enclosed in that volume that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So that is slavery. Now that's the institutional way of looking at it. But let's also look at the enslaved people themselves. And this first slide we see of Simon, who is self-emancipated, runs away on September 11th, 1740. Interestingly enough, just after uh, harvest, at the beginning of the colder season. Uh, he's about 40 years of age, which is pretty advanced during a time when life expectancy would not be much beyond that. Uh, he's tall, eh? uh, and he's been bred and born in this country, speaks very good English, can read and write, very slow in his speech, can bleed and draw teeth, so it, obviously he's a bit of a physician, pretending to be a great doctor, so he wants to say that he's somebody who's got skills and knowledge, okay? uh, very religious and says that he is a churchman. And that churchman or, uh, is a means by which he is going to uh, secure his freedom. And then we also see the kind of clothing he's wearing. Okay? Uh, and uh, also he takes a horse with him. So uh, that's Simon. Okay? And this is a man who is educated, has uh, professional skills, uh, and leaves his master, uh, James Leonard of, uh, of, of East Jersey, uh, in 1740. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, now, this is uh, Cato Elias Toby, who's about 30 years old, uh, who runs away from Middletown, East New Jersey. Excuse me for a second. What's interesting here is we can see the kind of homespun clothing he's wearing, bearskin coat. A uh, white woolen vest, buckskin breeches that was very common for enslaved people to make their own clothing. Uh, he'd been branded. Um, he's a very sly, artful fellow, someone uh, that the masters could not trust, deceives the credulous, and I think this is very wonderful, by telling fortunes. He's a cunning man and pretends to be free. And I was so taken by this phrase, pretends to be free, and all of the unconscious irony that we find in that, that I published a book of some 850 uh, runaway notices of Blacks from Revolutionary New York and East Jersey, uh, and titled it Pretends to be Free, as if these were people who wanted to be free, but white people did not see them that way. Okay, He plays on the fiddle. This is also something that's noteworthy. Um, as you can imagine, these kind of advertisements, which are published largely in Pennsylvania and New York newspapers. There aren't any Jersey newspapers before 1777. Okay, uh, are 
lend themselves to counting. And historians like to figure out how many uh, runaways could uh, speak English or Dutch, what kind of uh, clothing they wore, their hairstyles, and also their skills. And here we see that this man um, plays the fiddle. Okay? Uh, now, the fiddle was a very generic instrument in those days. And I learned by, again, counting the number of incidents of fiddlers in these advertisements, that it was far and away the most common skills. And these fiddlers, once out on their own, pretending to be free, could play Irish airs, English jigs, African music, any kind of popular melody that would entertain an audience and would earn them a few shillings. Okay? These people were known as songsters or physicianers. They're kind of the earliest forms of American musicians. And it's kind of fascinating that we can use these uh, advertisements to, to, to learn about uh, popular culture in early America. He's going towards the cedar swamps. Okay, and some base person has given him a pass. Okay? First, he's going to the swamps. We're learning more and more about these out of the way, largely inaccessible spots where runaways could congregate and create maroon communities. Apart from the rest of society, they could perhaps uh, find some form of uh, economic activity, uh, they could trade, but they could also could hide out there and perhaps for years. Some base person has given him a pass. Well, this is an 18th century version of the Underground Railroad. Someone who has given him uh, a pass. We're gonna see a pass a little bit later on. Dana's gonna show us one uh, in which a master uh, has given uh, an enslaved person permission to go out and find work elsewhere either as a hired person or perhaps even more permanently. But in this case, of course, this is something that's done without the master's permission. Okay, so Richard Stilwell is offering 40 shillings reward and reasonable charges. This was a way for young white men uh, to earn cash, uh, for sheriffs to pick up extra income uh, if these people were captured uh, and then return them to Richard Stilwell. So obviously, uh, Cato uh, was a very valuable person, but as we can see, someone of great intelligence, uh, someone who wanted to be free. So that gives us just a little sense about colonial culture. And again, there are hundreds and hundreds of these advertisements uh, that are available. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. Uh, now, during the American Revolution, of course, as you, many of you know, Monmouth County is a key staging ground. There's a major battle. Uh, the Battle of Monmouth in 1777. That's where C Colonel Ty first reappears in New Jersey, known as Captain Ty. And he was one of a number of Black loyalists. These are people who chose to fight with the crown because they were offered freedom in exchange for their military service, uh, for working as domestics, as washer people, as cooks, as spies, as scouts, many different ways that they could serve the British army and gain freedom. We know of at least 24 of them who leave from New York Harbor in the fall of 1783, bound for Nova Scotia. These are the called Black Loyalists. There are at least 24 of them from Monmouth, probably many, many more than that. Some of them claimed to be free. Others stated when they had left their master how long they'd served with the British. Okay. Uh, and this is a, a, a really an, a fascinating uh, document uh, that we can use to learn about the degree and breadth of black resistance during the American Revolution. There's something more that also I think is, is, is pretty fascinating about this. Um, when this Book of Negroes, as it was called, was first established, it came about because of a dispute between General George Washington, the commander in chief of the American forces, and Sir Guy Carleton, uh, who was the commander in chief of the British forces in North America. They were hammering out the details in the Treaty of Paris. Uh, so they were meeting in Fishkill. Article seven of the uh, uh, 
Treaty of Paris said that both sides should return property that had been taken during the American Revolution. And Washington had lost about 30 enslaved people to Dunmore's proclamation and later to what were called the Phillipsburg proclamations made by Generals Clinton and Howe around New Jersey and New York, but spread throughout the colonies and states, which advertised the same thing, freedom in exchange for military service. So Washington wanted whatever people were still possible to get, to get them back. So he asked Carlton about that, and Carlton said, they're gone. Gone, you say, said Washington, clearly chagrined and not a little angry. Okay? Carlton argued that to return Black people who had been invited into the Crown forces in exchange changing freedom, gaining their freedom for military service, to go back on that would be to dishonor the king's word. And he could not do that. Okay. This continued to be a great dispute. And so that's why they created this huge ledger of some 3,000 names. And I've recently uh, reprinted a version I did of this back in the 1990s. Uh, and it's got a full index. And there are about 400 people. Uh, from New Jersey listed uh, in this uh, uh, Book of the Negroes. A uh, couple of things about it. First of all, um, that Book of the Negro was established in case there would be some kind of settlement later on, cash that would be paid to the Americans. And this is something that the English and Americans quarreled about throughout the 1780s and 1790s. In fact, Thomas Jefferson, who was famous for maxing out his credit cards or his credit, uh, when asked if he would repay some of this to British creditors, said, I'll repay you when you pay for the black people that were stolen from me. Ultimately, in the War of 1812, another 5,000 enslaved people left with the British. The Americans and the uh, British then agreed to have arbitration done by the Tsar of Russia uh, to settle this dispute. The Tsar argued uh, that the Americans were entitled to some money, but established a principle by which a government seizing human property like this okay, had the right to do what they wanted to with them. Okay? This also was picked up by abolitionists, by William Jay, the, uh, the son of the first Chief Justice uh, and Governor of New York, in the late 1830s, and he said, this is a reason, a way that the federal government can uh, can free people. And of course, uh, you know where I'm headed on this, it's the rationale by which uh, President Abraham Lincoln uh, created the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, uh, freeing enslaved people uh, who were controlled by uh, the Southern rebels. So this is a, a really important thing, and it's nice to see uh, how Monmouth County Blacks uh, were, uh, part of a, a huge legal and social movement. The other thing I want to say is, um, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with uh, the controversy over the 1619 Project. And there, it's a fabulous and fascinating uh, uh, book, and I strongly encourage you to read it. One of the big criticisms that has been made of it is that um, it emphasizes that slavery was, defense of slavery was a reason why the American colonists separated from England. And some uh, historians, very prominent ones, say that simply was not true. Let's consider the work of Robert Parkinson, uh, who wrote an award-winning book called The Common Cause. And what Parkinson did is to look at hundreds of newspapers from 1774 through 1776 and found that the, one of the common causes, one of the reasons why the colonists were able to unite uh, in their struggle against the British was that they were deeply anxious and concerned about Native American alliances with the English and Black Risings. And go back to our friend Colonel Ty again, and others like him who were riding horses at night uh, going and stampeding around Monmouth County in 1774 and 1775, just as they also were becoming uncontrollable 
uh, and Freedom Bound and all of the other colonies. And, and Parkinson's book, which is, again, is thoroughly documented, demonstrates uh, just how the revolution was a time of immense fear on the part of white slave owners about the enslaved people uh, they were trying to control and keep from, 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 from the British. Okay. Now, after the American Revolution, uh, Northern states began the movement against slavery. They recognized that fundamental paradox about American slavery and American freedom. Uh, I think the most wonderful book that ever talked about this was Edmund Morgan's uh, fantastic book written in 1778, excuse me, 1976. Uh, Morgan was a, a, an esteemed scholar at Yale. He was a Sterling professor there wrote some of like 50 books, but this is probably his best. And what he, he what Morgan did uh, is to ask the question, how was it, what did it mean that the writers of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson okay, and, and others, the writers of the Constitution, George Washington, our first president, that these great espousers of American freedom were also slave owners. And so he said, this is the paradox of American society. And I think that Morgan, writing that book now some 45 years ago, touched upon something that we recognize today as being the great scar issue of American society, the unresolved wounds over race and slavery that exist to the present day. And now you can see that in all of the great political debates that we have in our time. Well, these are the kind of things that the... Uh, newly won Americans also were concerned about. So beginning in 1777, when Vermont, a breakaway uh, territory from Connecticut and New York, declared that slavery would no longer exist uh, in, in their area. Massachusetts and Pennsylvania followed suit in 1780, establishing a gradual emancipation. Connecticut in 1784, and other Northern states, with the important exceptions of New York and New Jersey, where the most enslaved people were held, did very quickly. Only after a great deal of debate did New York in 1799 and New Jersey in 1804 declare that there would be gradual emancipation. What they meant by that is that all of those enslaved people born in New Jersey before July 4th, 1804 would be slaves for the rest of their life. They were just the unlucky ones. Those born after that would have to serve a term of service to their masters, 25 years for men, 21 years for women. This is a substantial portion of a person's ex life expectancy during the time, and certainly a great amount of their productive years. The other thing that could happen, and this is, there are a couple of fascinating documents about this, is that first of all, uh, the first thing that had to be registered. So we see here the Black Birth Book, and this was published in the 1980s um, by the Monmouth County uh, uh, government. Uh, and it details all of the Blacks who were born in Monmouth County after 1804 and were to gain their freedom after those years of service. The other thing the masters could do is they could abandon these infants and put them out as a public charge and then agree with the county that they would take care of them and also gain their labor. And this is a very duplicitous method by which these masters could be paid good money um, by the county and by the state for care of people whom they had owned at birth. This got to be such a burden that the state nearly went bankrupt in 1807 okay, uh, and had to declare that law invalid. Around the same time, by the way, uh, there are a number of petitions, which we find in the New Jersey State Archives down in Trenton, from former masters saying, you know, that the Grimes Emancipation Act was a great mistake, that it was depriving New Jersey residents of the property that they had fought for and defended during the American Revolution. And that simply New Jersey should continue uh, to be a, a slave state. Okay? Uh, but this indicates how important and widely supported slavery was in New Jersey. Next slide, please. 
Here we see the black population of Monmouth County between 1784 and 1860. And you can see that uh, enslaved people were a fairly sizable portion of uh, the uh, uh, population of Monmouth County, ranging uh, from uh, uh, 11% and just gradually declining later on, but that enslaved people were a sizable portion of that. There were not very many free people, even in 1790. Now, by the way, many of the free people uh, in Monmouth County and other New Jersey uh, counties gained their freedom by making deals with their masters and saying, look, you know, I will serve you for a certain number of years and then serve you well, and then you must give me my freedom. This becomes more and more uh, uh, common uh, after the gradual emancipation in 1804. There also are a number of masters uh, who realize that paradox, the contradiction of the American Revolution and free enslaved people. Okay, so gradually that's happening. But even so, you can see that as late as 1830, there are still 227 enslaved people. And incredibly, in 1850, a half century after gradual emancipation is, is uh, declared, there are 75 enslaved people. Now, comment on this. What happened in 1846 is that New Jersey decided it was going to uh, end slavery finally. And so it transitions those people who are still enslaved into a position of kind of lifetime apprenticeship. And this is largely done to keep masters from pushing elderly slaves, people over the age of 45, out into the world without any support. And one can look at the thousands of wills and probate records created by masters in New Jersey without ever finding that amount of money was put aside for an enslaved person who had served the master well uh, over many, many decades. Okay. The other thing, too, is if you think about it, most of those people who were those 75 enslaved people in 1850, that they uh, were um, very aged, that they had given their lives to someone that they perhaps might go back as far as 1800 or before that and been enslaved all of their lives. I was astonished to find uh, in 1857 a, uh, a runaway notice uh, ask, asking for the return of an enslaved person and the Monmouth Democrat. This is four years before the, Amer the American Civil War at a time when slavery is supposed to be dead in the North. So this gives you a sense. And also we can see the next slide, please. The dis disposition of wills by slavery, by, by uh, of, uh, sl excuse me, slaves by will in Monmouth County. Uh, a number of enslaved people bequeathed to the next generation, to the widow, to the daughters, to other relatives. There were gradual emancipations or some encumbered ones, but these slaves for a term or term slaves as they were called after the gradual emancipation could be sold, hired out, and sometimes in very disgraceful situations, gulled into signing contracts, allowing the master then to sell them to slave traders who would take them down to the deep south into the voracious maw of the slave states, the cotton states, where enslaved people were uh, sought at a premium. So even sometimes, and this, there are scandals about this, children or infants of just a few months were said to have agreed to be sold down into the south. And of course, they didn't understand that. And ultimately, there were laws passed about that. But this gives you a sense of just how important uh, slavery was as a means of sustaining wealth across the generations. Okay, so next slide, please. But the study of slavery in New Jersey, several people have done this. I've done a couple of books on it. James G. Gantino has done a very good book about slavery. One of the ways that we differ uh, is that I also emphasize the growth, gradual growth of an, a black middle class. And we can see in these early photographs of a, a man and a woman from the Red Bank area that they are well-dressed, uh, they look healthy, 
uh, prosperous. They probably own small amounts of land, perhaps own their house. They are members of churches, of fraternal organizations. They are people who are educated, go to the schools, okay? uh, and who are taking part in the community as free people. Okay? And there are several thousand of these people and gradually they're able to establish property, to own possessions, to create images like this of themselves. Okay, next slide, please. There are still many, however, of course, who are still living in semi-poverty. And we can see these pictures uh, who are living outside the home of Mary Holmes Taylor, uh, where she's, uh, this is uh, uh, Isabel with her children, John and Effie. Now, something fascinating about this, uh, masters would oftentimes offer to enslave people on the cusp of their freedom, a choice that they could either stay with the master, have a home on their property, be given tools, seed, plot of land, some salary every year, and stay there for the rest of their lives. Or if they wanted to go free, they should never darken the master's door again. There would be no reparations, no payment for long years of service. This cottaging system, as it was known, in Monmouth and other New Jersey counties, of course, is a precursor of uh, uh, sharecropping that was popularized in the American South after the Civil War. Okay. Uh, so this gives you just a little sense. But now, next slide, please. This is a runaway ad. Uh, this is a stellar indication. This is 1830. Okay. Uh, this is of uh, uh, a black boy named Elias. Okay, who changed his name Bob. This is a frequent way by which enslaved people could try to uh, secure their freedom. Okay, uh, a very good description of him. Okay, and also uh, uh, the clothing he's taken with him. Black people oftentimes took extra suits of clothes to sell, uh, to use for themselves. But that's quite fascinating. This is William Van Dorn, uh, who's trying to retain this man a quarter century after uh, the end of gradual, beginning of gradual emancipation. Next slide, please. Critical to the growth of black communities is the church. And with the establishment of the AME Zion and Episcopal denominations in the early part of the 19th century, churches like this famous St. James African AME Zion Church in Matawan okay, spread widely across the North. Uh, Nathan Hatch in his wonderful book, The Democratization of American Christianity, has identified uh, churches like this one as a natural growth, outgrowth of the promise and the beliefs of the American Revolution, that people could establish a faith of their own. And so the AME Zion and Episcopal churches are just that. They also are critically important in the Underground Railroad. Uh, a place of offering succor and food and clothing for self-emancipated people coming up from Maryland, Virginia, uh, and, and the Carolinas. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Oh, actually, we'll go back to the last one. I'm going to talk a little bit more. Please go back one more. Uh, so by um, the Civil War, uh, a number of Blacks in Monmouth County uh, go to serve in the Union troops. They have to go to Camp Penn uh, near Philadelphia, which is the farm of Lucretia Mott, uh, to uh, uh, enroll in the, uh, in the Union Army. New Jersey, a very conservative state. Uh, the Democratic Party um, was very much pro-slavery. Uh, New Jersey voted twice against Abraham Lincoln. It vo voted twice it voted against all three of the Reconstruction Amendments. Um, so basically, slavery was not fully ended uh, in New Jersey until 1865. Um, but yet, Black men uh, from Mama took part in natu national conventions, but had very little political power. And they didn't have a sufficient amount of the vote. Um, they were considered to be sort of a, a fringe part of the Republican Party at the time. Um, but still, they were able to take part in national movements to build a kind of proto-politics. And this would take a long time to do so. Uh, there's an important decision 
made during the reconstruction period in Fair Haven. And this for this, uh, the best place to consult this is in uh, Marion Thompson Wright Reader. She's got a number of pages on a dispute in Fair Haven in Monmouth County uh, in 1881. Uh, and then she talks about this in the education of Negroes in New Jersey. Basically, the problem arose was like this. During the antebellum period, with the rise of the public school movement, uh, blacks and whites oftentimes studied in the same buildings and they were not segregated. Uh, there were some 50 uh, black people studying with whites in 1850 in Monmouth County. Uh, there were uh, about 130 uh, black people studying in public schools in 1860. Okay. After the Civil War, with the rise of racism, okay, with the sense of, uh, of grievance, when the teacher of the black school in Fairhaven resigned, the students were sort of adrift. Several applied to a white school. So the development of, of these black schools uh, apart from uh, the, the white public schools, white parents objected. The school board decided then to build, to create another black school. Okay? But black parents who were upset that their children had been refused uh, were also noted out that the uh, black school was poorly heated, um, that it was badly equipped, and then it burned down. Okay? And so they wanted admission to the, uh, uh, to the white school. They hired a lawyer and complained about their conditions. There were rumors that there was going to be a major dispute. The Board of Ed agreed to use the taxes for, to create a separate school and did so under a kind of a, a local option. This amendment uh, to the state law of 1881 allowed for separate schools if there was a sufficient number. There's a huge debate about that. Under the influence of General Carlton, Clinton B. Fisk, and the school is named after him, promoted separate schools and agreed upon by Reverend Benjamin Williams, the pastor of AME Zion Church. Okay. This became the trend around the state. There would be some integrated schools, such as Newark High School, later Barringer, where Marion Thompson Wright attended in the late 1810s, early 18, 19, 1910s, and early 1920s, but generally schools were segregated. And this leads to the Jim Crow society that existed in New Jersey and New York, as well as in the South uh, across the 20th century. So what we see is that out of slavery and freedom in Monmouth County, there were substantial a number of gains, but there also were the continuance of that American paradox of slavery and freedom, that the scars, the unresolved issues of slavery continued long into the 19th century and into the 20th century. It would not be until the 1950s and 1960s that schools would be integrated and that African-Americans would have greater political power, something you're still ascending to. So I think this is important to see uh, that Monmouth County, with its diversity of faith, of peoples, of historical experience, is very closely tied to the larger patterns and histories of American society. Okay. Oh, there we go. So these are really fascinating documents that, uh, that Dana has shown me from the collection of the Monmouth County uh, Historical Society. Uh, I'm trying to, this one of them is a, uh, looks like a, a hire, is that right? It's a bill of sale. Uh, bill of sale, right. Um, if you could, could you read that for us? Uh, okay, so we have a bill of sale to uh, David Brearley. It says Negro Lewis. Um, Rarely a Negro boy, about 17 years of age. I can't read it because the, uh, okay, well, let me move okay. my camera. All right, uh, is, is, um, is to become free, okay? Uh, so basically this is a, an example of a, a, a young man who's got eight years left to go uh, on his uh, term of, of, of servitude. And again, this is a form of property, even though he's going to be free, it's not going to be right away. I think there's also another document attached to this one as well, right? Yeah, the next one is, uh, hold on. 
my PowerPoint is being difficult. Okay, there we go. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is so he's got about two years and seven months uh, to to work, uh, but not wanted by the family. So he this gives him a pass uh, to seek work elsewhere, uh, not exceeding thirty miles uh, from their residence. Okay, and this is by the master's own choice. This is a means by which um, this young man, Lewis, can go out and find work elsewhere. Okay? Uh, and probably he would have to pay David Brerley uh, the money that he's earned, just as Frederick Douglass famously had to pay his master uh, when he was hired out in Baltimore. So this is a, a local example of this. It's a very rare document. We don't see a lot of these, uh, these passes, but this meant that basically Lewis could go out and around and look for work uh, and not be arrested. Yeah, um, one of the things you had mentioned before was encumbered emancipation. I had not heard that term before. So I was kind of looking it up in your book and you mentioned the 1714 law, something about 200 pound surety to be paid upon freeing somebody. Is that? Yeah. Um, this is a pretty amazing amount of money. So the, yeah, uh, Dana is referring to the original laws, the codification of slavery that happened in the early uh, 18th century. Uh, there are a couple of aspects of those documents. One of them is that uh, slavery does not disturb, uh, baptism does not disturb one's civil condition, which meant basically that men like Lewis Morris could send their enslaved people uh, to SBG schools uh, and have them baptized without them being free, because that was uh, an ancient belief that uh, baptized Christians should not be en enslaved. But the other part of this uh, is that if a master, out of the goodness of his or her heart, wanted to free an enslaved person, they would have to post a bond of some 200 pounds. That's a colossal amount of money. Uh, to ensure that that person would not become a charge on the community. Uh, there were not a lot of free people. Uh, there were not a lot of examples of Blacks who became uh, charges on the community. They had to be supported. Uh, so this is really an impediment to emancipation. Uh, along with this, of course, if this was done by a will, uh, the uh, people who are in, in, getting this inheritance would immediately contest it because it's a sizable amount of money that they would be out because it had to be posted with uh, the local government. Uh, it also had to be signed off by a uh, local mayor, by the assemblyman, oftentimes by the governor. So it's a big deal. To, in order to find to someone to gain freedom by legal emancipation in New Jersey and also in New York, had to go through a lot of hoops and one of them would be the posting of that bond. So that's, that's what that's all about. It's really, it's a major hurdle that is placed in the way uh, of someone becoming free in the 18th century. And uh, one other thing that you said that I guess I had never really thought about was you were talking about the integration of schools and how many kids, you know, how many black kids were in with white kids prior to like 1860, um, but that there was a rise of racism after the Civil War. And I guess that's what, just because of the contentious nature of the, you know, that the war was fought over slavery and maybe. Well, yes, sure. I mean, of course, this is a famous part of American history and mostly associated with the South. Uh, and the South embraces what's called the lost cause. Um, and this becomes more popular in, in, in the early part of the 20th century. Basically, it says that uh, you know, the Civil War was a mistake. Slavery was good. Uh, that Blacks were best off in a form of enslavement. Uh, but it also exists in the, the North. And part of it is because with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, for the first time, whites, including many very conservative whites in New Jersey and New York, are confronted with black men whom they have to treat as political and social equals. Okay? And this is something that creates a great deal of consternation, especially because those black men are pushing for more and more rights, okay? who want to make political deals. They want to have their own forms of prosperity. And this is very threatening. And so, yeah, I mean, you get a, the, racism is something which we generally identify with the South, but in the North, 
it's also a very prominent feature. The other thing that happens, of course, is, is that gradually there is a, a kind of social Darwinism uh, in the belief, which is very widespread um, in the North, that Blacks are simply inferior. Uh, they're incapable of becoming good citizens. And this is the foundation for uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, the famous Supreme Court case, uh, which uh, legalizes uh, separate but equal schools and, 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 and social conditions. But it's also one in the North, uh, which denies Blacks political power and social equality. We can see this, for example, in uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was uh, a professor at Princeton, later uh, president of Princeton University, later governor of New Jersey, and of course, ultimately president of the United States during the second decade of the 20th century. And uh, Wilson, who's from the South, but spent many, many years in, in, in New Jersey, uh, firmly believed that, that the South and slavery was a superior way of, of life, uh, refused to allow Blacks to be uh, uh, admitted to Princeton University, uh, and uh, in every way tried to segregate uh, the, uh, the civil service. So, um, yeah, this is something that racism was very, very strong in the South, but also very, very strong in the North. Okay. Well, I think that's about it. Okay. Well, great. I'm glad we were able to, to, to do this. And uh, I thank everybody for coming. And I hope that this was something you enjoyed. And I strongly encourage you to go and uh, take a look at the books and learn more about Black Life in Monmouth County. And thank Absolutely. you very much, Jenna, for hosting this. We'll put that on your website, uh, on our website, actually. <laughs> we'll put your books on our website so that people can, uh, they know where to find them. Okay, thanks. Thank you so okay. much, Graham. Okay.